Welcome to Promote Profit Publish. I'm your host, Juliette Clark, and we have a really great guest today who is also a 2024 magazine contributor. And I'm really excited for you to hear her insights because 2024 could be a really interesting year for businesses. Not only are we looking at almost certainty of a recession, but also it's an election year, which is always sort of a bad year for many businesses. So before we get started with our guest, I'd love to invite you to go over and check out the magazine, www.breakthroughauthormagazine.com. Our goal this year is helping authors sell more books. So our common theme throughout that you will see are methods, tactics, procedures, whatever you want to call them to sell books on your own and get rid of the 55% that distributors take. So just a little whistle wetter. Imagine that you've just produced your first book and it's $20 literally the retailer who sells it gets 55% or $11 of that. And that doesn't even count the cost to uh, print the book. So you're, the authors are being left with less and less. And, and consider this is your life's work. So it is really important that you make money, generate revenue from it. Today's guest is Jackie Nagel, and she's the founder of Synovatia. I can never say that. A strategic business coaching and consultancy firm. She is known for her unwavering commitment commitment to supporting small businesses and her deep interest in science-based performance strategies. I love that. Jackie's approach involves providing personalized strategic coaching tailored to the individual needs of her clients, both on a personal and professional level. Her clients greatly appreciate her keen insights into what makes what it takes to succeed in a constantly changing and increasingly demanding business environment. And for those of you who listen, are listening right now, and you've written a book and you own a business, you know that's true. So stay tuned for Jackie. Jackie, welcome. I'm so excited to have you as part of the magazine this year. Oh, thank you. I have to thank you so much. It's such a great opportunity to work with you. Oh, I'm excited. I, we're we're going to have other opportunities too, but uh, I'm excited about that because I feel like the government keeps saying we're not in a recession. We are. And now we're getting into 2024, an election year where typically businesses start you know, pulling back their money because there's so much uncertainty. So I feel like between the two, 2024 is going to be really a challenge for people. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, it's kind of interesting. I think the key is, I think business is a challenge for some people, regardless of the economy, because perhaps they haven't set their business up to function well. And so they have a tendency to get blown back and forth on whatever happens to be going on. And, and for those who have really established, they've proven their, their business model, they've proven their client base, they have a lot, they've proven their sales and their marketing model, they have actually a lot more strength and sustainability. It's not like they're not going to be affected by it, but the impact is much less. Um, one other thing I want to say is that one of the things that we've noticed is that companies who grow at a rate of about 15% every other, every year will double in five years. They're less, again, impacted by circumstances around them. And ideally, companies that grow at a rate of 20% year over year have greater sustaining power. So that's something to keep in mind. Like when we had the recession in 2008, right? Mm -hmm. The companies that the companies that I work with, the small businesses that I work with, those who had that 20%, 18 to 20% growth rate year over year after year were impacted, but not to the same degree as other people. Interesting. So it, it's very important to, to go towards that growth every year. Yeah. And to keep uh, upgrading technology and upgrading your systems. And that's probably one of the biggest things that uh, interested me in Messy in the Middle is I've been a part of a mastermind for a while and I don't, I'm growing, but two things. I don't see the growth consistent and I don't, uh, I, when I'm on this mastermind, I hear the same problems over and over and don't feel like anybody's solving them, if that makes sense. So tell us a little bit about Messy in the Middle. Oh, okay. So <laughs> So yeah, that's not good, right? <laughs> um, that's like, uh, what do they call that? Groundhog's Day, the movie, right? Yes. <laughs> Wake up every day. No. So um, 
Well, we started looking at the, the messy middle because of the, the stages that a lot of my clients were going through, where they seemed to hit a plateau. And it happened around 250, 300,000. The growth started to stall. Regardless of what they did, they just stayed stuck, you know, mm -hmm. and it was still very overwhelming, a lot of chaos, a lot of stress going on, limited cash flow. And so we started really looking at what's going on for businesses in this arena. And what we found is there were some strategies that we could put in place, some strategies, some tactics. We really started to unravel everything so that people could actually start moving forward. And one of the biggest things that I learned by working with my clients, and, and I've said this so often, is what got you here won't get you there. And it's about, we can't use the same tool set or toolkit mm -hmm. that got us to 200,000 or 250 to get us to a half million. It just doesn't work. And it just becomes craziness. So it's about up-leveling mindset, skill set, technology, I mean, all, talent, a lot of different factors. What do, what do you think is the biggest factor there? Because from, from what I hear on those calls, I hear business people not setting good boundaries. And that whole, you know, it's kind of a pattern over and over and over. They come to the table with the same problem. And, and I sit there on the screen and I'm like, set some boundaries. Like, oh, <laughs> what do you think it is? Because I'm not the expert here. <laughs> well, and, and it's so individual for every business, what kind of challenges that they have. So when I hear, like you were saying, setting some boundaries, then I'm thinking, okay, they're bringing problems to the table that require that, right? Boundaries. Interesting, because a lot of the clients that I work with, their biggest challenge, I would have to say, would be, well, maybe boundaries are part of this. It would be the mindset in that, you know, they're used to doing things by themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And right. now all of a sudden they can't do everything by themselves anymore. And they need to bring in the talent, which is always challenging because I always feel like talent has an evil twin called delegation. And mm -hmm. It's like, let it go, you know, like the yeah. frozen, let it go. <laughs> but it's also about, this is kind of going down a rabbit hole on the talent aspect, but it's hiring good quality talent. Don't scrimp on your talent. Don't cut corners on talent because you mm -hmm. will pay a price for that. It's a big drain on cash. If you're hiring talent you can't trust, to do the job because then you can't delegate. You yeah. should be able to delegate to them. So for me, it was the mindset uh, in seeing people to shift how they saw themselves from being the, I do it all. Even though I have a business, it's really, I'm a solo, I'm functioning mentally like a solopreneur to think about, oh, now I've got to start growing my team and sharing some of the responsibility of the workload with other people. And that's hard for a lot of people to let go and trust. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole process. You don't just let it go, right? There's a process that you put in place so that you can trust the people. It's hiring the right talent. It's onboarding them correctly. It is um, mentoring them properly and then giving them the work to match their skills, but also understanding yourself and what you need to hear from them and get from them in order to to eventually trust them. Yeah, that is a that is a big and that's probably the biggest thing I hear that I was saying over and over like you haven't let go of that yet. Um, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, right. That's what I you know. So the same people will get on and they'll talk about that, you know, oh, I'm still overwhelmed, I'm stressed, my family's not getting attention. It's like, well, did you hire those people yet? You know? Can I tell you a quick story Yeah, on that line? So and a, a friend of mine who's in HR and I teamed up to put together a performance management system for a local uh, accounting firm. And um, I did the strategy part and the, the growth planning and she did the HR part. And it was so funny because there was an issue that came, 
kept coming up with this one employee, right? And it was, but we love her. She's fabulous. I just think the best of her. She's the greatest. And then it was all the complaints about her performance or lack thereof. And finally, about the third time we gave them, we both gave them ideas and suggestions of what they needed to do. And they never did anything with it. So finally, when they brought it up the third time, we said, I'm sorry, that's off the table. We won't discuss that with you anymore because it was just a waste of time. You know, why keep talking about that if you're not going to do anything about it? And that was the impetus that they went, oh, I guess we better do something about this. <laughs> right? I mean, it, it is, it's easy to, it's easier to complain than to get into action sometimes. And especially, I think every company has that, that really, you know, great employee that everybody likes, but they're not necessarily the most productive. And I, I ran into that at Mattel. The guys that were universally liked were also the ones that walked around for, you know, an hour after they got there and an hour after lunch schmoozing instead of working. So right, no right. wonder everybody liked them. <laughs> well, and the one thing that I would say too, is if people are having trouble taking action, there's a reason why. And it requires a little bit of digging to find out why. And sometimes it's a matter of maybe there's a, uh, the plan isn't complete enough for them. The action plan isn't complete enough for them. It doesn't feel comfortable enough for them to take the required action. So once we can drill down into that and find out why they're not taking the action and then we put the, you know, solve that problem, it becomes much easier for them to do that. So what you're saying is you're part psychologist too. <laughs> well, I have a, I have a, I have a friend, a former client who calls me his, his business shrink, right? <laughs> this therapist. So yeah, it is, but it's about performance. And I mean, it's not just performance of the people that who are on our team, but it's our own performance and you know, things that kind of trip us up as well. So a lot of what I gathered from talking to you before, a lot of what you do is work-life balance too, because I know you, you grab, you get into the personal growth as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? So, um, you know, businesses are used, well, let me see, how do I want to say that? Success for the sake of success is just for the money part of it. Mm -hmm. I just think it's really dangerous. I have had my own personal experiences where it's the way in which I was working. I was tremendously successful, but the way in which I was working was damaging my health. Mm -hmm. And so based on my own experiences, I try and help my clients think about how do we achieve this success without breaking your health? Because it can be done. It just is a way of we've got to think differently about it. And so in business objectives and goals, I always see them as being, they're, they're not separate. They don't stand alone. We are, why are we in business? Why do we do what we do? Certainly we love it, but there's an end game. It might be to fund retirement, to buy a house. And, and so, you know, so you can't, I always feel like I can't just look at the business. I have to look at the, the entire person because the business is just one piece of it. Mm -hmm. I don't always have real good luck in getting them to, but I try, you know, but again, I think it's like, um, there was a workshop that I was involved in, in the eighties, which really dates me, but it was with judge Ziegler, Zig Ziegler's brother. And he said, if you work 40%, 40 hours a week, you will be, well, this is if you're employed, but he said, you will be in the top 10% of your company. If you work 50, 60 hours a week, you'll be in the top 1%. But if you work 70 hours a week, you are an F-O-O-L. And I thought, a fool. <laughs> okay. And I think that pertains to businesses too. What are we doing? Why are we needing to work 70 hours a week? Can't we fix that? I mean, and it to me, it's about what it does to us, not only physically, but mentally. And to make really smart strategic decisions, you've got to be sharp. You can't be exhausted. Right. 
So yeah, that's that's so true. And even that other part, that that personal part too, you can't really run family when you're exhausted either. I think that's part of it too. If you're not present for you know those times when your children are growing up or you know other things like that, it can create problems. And it's such a different way because I remember my parents worked all the time and never got to games. When I started my first business, that was that was my goal. I never missed a child's game. I ne- I worked it all out. And sometimes it was a bit stressful, but I think my children would tell you that they feel very privileged because there were so many other kids that that didn't have parents that showed up for them. Well, and I think we need role models of women like yourself who have done it successfully. And there's another friend of mine who owns a very successful business on the East Coast who never worked past three o'clock because her kids were coming home. And I think we need to talk about that more. We see not to be disrespectful of the men that are business owners, but their lifestyle is completely, generally, I shouldn't say completely, but it's generally different than ours. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of what is required. And so we need more women business owners to speak up about how they are successfully managing all of it. The other thing I want to say about work-life balance, I think that's kind of a really difficult thing for people too, because the balance kind of gives the indication that we we spend 20 hours here and 20 hours there. And I recently heard a phrase that I thought makes a lot more sense. It's calling it work-life satisfaction. I like that. Are we satisfied with our work and what we're doing? Are we satisfied with our personal aspect of things and what we're doing and how we're, what we're dedicating to it? And that works. I like, oh, go ahead. No, it just seems to work better. Yeah, I like that a lot because the other way, work-life balance is something that I have to go achieve, which is just one more thing to achieve. Right. But work life satisfaction indicates that I have choices. So I think I like that a lot better as as a way to describe that, because then it's me being empowered to choose where I'm going to spend my time. And, you know, in order to do that as a woman business owner, I may have to hire someone to come in and and do some of that work to be home. And that's when I was married. That was our that was our thing. I got up really early and worked. I was off by three. So he took the kids to school. I picked him up. So there was always someone there, which I don't know. I guess these days they call that a hover parent or something like that. A helicopter parent, but you know, we just always, we both grew up in families where we didn't have those parents engaged in that way and we wanted to be different. So um, I think I love that satisfaction because it does indicate that you have a choice in the matter. It's not, not one more thing I have to achieve. I know. Gosh, I can't have one more thing on my list to check off. Come on. Right. I I totally agree. So when you help people do this, um, where, where do you see the point where they, they can get, what do they have to achieve to get past that messy in the middle phase? Is that something that you can do in three months or is it really a long-term, you know, you lay out the plan and then you start working it? Well, I think again, it depends upon the business. So it's really, uh, difficult to guarantee a certain time frame. And, but I will tell you one of the biggest linchpins that I've seen is in bringing in the talent. And for some companies, you know, and the, the challenge with the bringing in the talent is always the cash flow. And I will tell you, if at all possible, here's what I've seen several of my clients do very successfully to kind of make that leap is they took out a small business loan, but they didn't just take out a loan to fund this talent. They took out a loan. They looked at how they were going to have to pay it back. And they also, it was an SBA loan, I think. And then they also looked at They were very strategic in how they approached it in terms of what they were going to have to do to make that pay off. So it wasn't just an expense, but that it was an investment. So it was, you know, the outcomes, the Excel spreadsheets to kind of do um, an analysis about what that's going to look like. And I also think it gave them confidence to know that this would not be a burden that they're going to have over their head because that's always the biggest thing. Well, what fear? What if I take out a loan and I can't pay it back? Well, they had worked out the plan of how that was all going to be paid back and what they would need to do to pay that back. And, um, and then it also, and that made them think really smart and hard also about who they were going to hire what talent they were going to hire because some talent you can hire, like you can hire an assistant, 
But that assistant, does, the question always is, does that assistant contribute to your revenue and to your profit? So that's the fastest way is get somebody in there who's a revenue generator. And then, you know, then it kind it, but that starts the ball rolling with most of the companies that I've worked with to elevate them to the next level. And I'll give you an example. So one client that has hired several people does extremely well, pays his people really well. And, but we've noticed a difference in his profit margins, right? With hiring employees before the accounts are there, the sales or the, yeah, the accounts are there, the business is there to train them up. So we've started to work on a hybrid model where he has some employees and some contracts for hire because he doesn't, what, what happens sometimes in the whole process too of the talent piece is that, and an HR person can certainly talk to this, but I talk about it from a strategy standpoint and a profit standpoint, is that um, you can have the best hiring process in place and think you're getting exactly the right person. And then they can start working and find out it's not really a good fit. And, um, and you lose money and you lose time when that happens. And when we saw the difference in the profit margin between bringing an employee on and possibly facing that versus working with a contractor for a period of time, that was what we decided to go with is this contract for hire. Let's hire them. It gives us time to ramp up lead generation and the accounts bring on new clients without making a major commitment with salary and benefits and all of that, just in case they don't perform at the level that we, that they said they were going to perform. So, yes. <laughs> so I think it's about rethinking to the whole hiring model. Yeah, I think so too. We, my, my assistant is actually contracted help. Uh, most, most of my company is, but for different reasons, because I work out of my home, but also too, it's not a big deal if, if they're not performing, you know, you don't have to face somebody face to face and say, hey, you're fired. <laughs> right. Um, and I did just recently have a situation where I hired someone and within a week she was gone. So it is really, uh, it can really be a problem. But the other part of that is that once you get that person person trained. Now you're in a position, me, I'm in a position to lead Jen more. I'm in a position to uh, close those deals because I'm the rainmaker. And I'm sure it's that way for a lot of solopreneurs yeah. that, you know, the more you have taken off your plate, the more you time you can spend doing that as well. It's funny that you use the plate as the analogy, because that's what we look at. Okay. Think for a moment, visualize what's on your plate and what is it that only you can do? And what is it that can be moved off? And then we just start moving one piece at a time off. I mean, you can't just, it'd be great if you could flip a switch and get and have, you know, the winning numbers of the lottery to, you know, to bring in all the support you need, but it's just one step at a time. And I often think of the story of my dad, who was a diesel mechanic and he owned his own business. And I'm telling you, he worked on balers and tractors and stuff like that. And when he passed away, the man had this, unbelievable treasure trove of tools. And I know he didn't buy all those tools at one time, but one step, one tool at a time. And that's kind of the, you know, and eventually he accumulated this just unbelievable amount of tools that he used. But, and it's the same way for us in the messy middle. It's one thing at a time. Don't panic. You'll get through it. Let's do one thing, get that done, then let's go back to the plate, find out what ne number two is. Don't overwhelm yourself with change because you're going through enough change as it is. Yeah, that is so true. And I don't think anybody works well in overwhelm. We yeah. have uh, we have our traffic school product and um, we only let people one module at a time, even though those modules are connected because of that. If you try to do everything at once, nothing's going to be done well. And, right. you know, right. that's just that's bad. <laughs> that's bad, yeah. bad business. So, so Jackie, where can we find you if we want to learn more about Messy in the Middle? So you can go to Cinevatia.com, I'll spell that, S-Y-N-N-O-V-A-T-I-A.com, and it talks about our strategy services, but there's also a community that we have set up. It's a free community to people 
who are business owners that are caught in this messy middle. And then we also offer a quarterly mastermind for business owners um, that are in the similar stage of business for get coming together, uh, problem solving, sharing what's working for them and collaborating. You'll find that on the site as well. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And we're looking forward to your insights in 2024. Yes, thank you. Can I say one last thing? Absolutely. Or I leave. I just want to really compliment you as well. Your author, Traffic School, is a, a marvel of resources. I was so impressed when I went there. And oh, also um, the fact that you have one of the top, um, you're in the top 10% of all podcasts globally. And I want to say that on this podcast, because I know you don't toot your own horn. So I hope you'll include that in there. Oh, well, thank you. Yes. And uh, not many people know that that I have an elite podcast. Uh, I, the podcast company keeps telling me that. And I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> uh, that's, a big deal. that's a big deal. Sometimes it's better when other people say it, right? Uh, right. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you.